In this video, we are going to look at instruction memory and understand some possibilities for how it can be implemented. We'll start by looking at the requirements of an instruction memory and then look at implementation aspects, including some possibilities in terms of how the Verilog code itself could be written. So the first thing we need to think about is what exactly is the purpose of instruction memory? It is after all a, stor a storage location from which instructions are read. One of the related questions becomes what is the length of an instruction? Now in the case of the RISC-V architecture, as mentioned earlier, we have 32-bit instructions. Every instruction is a fixed size of exactly 32 bits. But this is not absolutely necessary. In particular, the x86 architecture has a variable length instruction. Instructions could be anywhere from one byte to about six or seven bytes even. The next question becomes, should the instruction memory be modifiable? In other words, should it be possible to write data into the instruction memory or is it some kind of read-only memory? There are two ways of looking at this. From the context of a single program, you do not need to modify the instruction memory. It is read-only. On the other hand, the question then arises, how do you load new programs? How does an operating system, for example, load a program into memory and execute it? This leads us to the requirement that the instruction memory should in some way be modifiable, especially in the context of systems where we want to be able to run multiple programs, either concurrently, at least in the context that in a time sharing system, or one after another. That is, we finish one program and then move on to the next one. Either way, one interesting aspect that is thrown up by the ability to modify instruction memory is that you could also potentially have a concept called self-modifying code. That is, a program can rewrite itself or can change the instructions that it is programmed with. This can potentially lead to applications that are either interesting or dangerous, but is outside the scope of what we are discussing in this course. So we will leave it at that. Now, the next question is, what is the size of the instruction memory? Once again, this is a question that depends on what kind of application we are looking at. Ultimately, the applications would determine how big the instruction memory needs to be. In general, of course, the larger, the bigger, but there are also benefits to having a small instruction memory. In particular, it will be faster. It will consume less power. And one last question that we need to answer when we are trying to construct the instruction memory is what kind of read latency is acceptable? And by read latency, what I mean is after you put out the instruction address, how long does it take to actually get the instruction back from memory? And in particular, one thing that we need to be concerned with is, do we need to wait until the next clock edge before the data, that is the instruction, is ready for us to operate with? Or will it be given to us within the same clock cycle itself? For now, we are going to focus on the instruction memory required for the RISC-5 32-bit architecture. And what that means is we store only instructions. All instructions are 32 bits in width. We can assume that we are working with a read-only system for now at least. We will look at how to modify the instructions and how to load new programs later. But in particular, we do not have to worry about reading half words of 16 bits or bytes, that is 8-bit values. Every single read from the memory is going to be a single 32-bit value. which means that we can now think of implementing it as an instruction array, which is 32 bits wide and takes in an I address where the number of bits in the address is less than or equal to 32. Why? In general, because our addresses are also generated or derived from values that are stored in the register file. And since the register file itself has a width of 32 bits, it makes sense for us to think of the instruction address being less than or equal to 32 bits. Of course, this is not absolutely necessary. There are ways of handling larger address spaces as well. But for now, we are not even going to go close to that limit. So we will not discuss this further for the time being. What about the output of the array? It is 32 bits because that's after all the width of the array itself. One interesting thing to keep in mind over here is the fact that the memory blocks that we usually consider are byte addressable. 
we always talk of memory as being one gigabyte or a hundred megabytes we do not generally speaking talk out of 32 bit words and the number of locations for those the reasons for this are of course historical starting from the early days of popularly used computers at least people spoke in terms of bytes as the basic unit of memory storage what this means is that since one word is four bytes every valid instruction address must be a multiple of four if it is not that essentially leads to a so-called misaligned memory access or an instruction access and in our case what we will do is we will leave that as an exceptional case in fact it leads to something called an alignment exception exceptions as we will see later are the way that processors deal with problems for now we will just leave it at that we will assume that all addresses are multiples of four and in fact to enforce this what we will do is we will take the incoming address and only take the bits from 31 down to 2 and discard the lowest two bits 1 and 0 forcing them to 0 so that the address automatically becomes a multiple of 4. Now what about timing? Let's assume that we have a clock as shown over here. Now if you look at the instruction memory that I have drawn there is no clock associated with it. But what we will have is that the program counter that generates the address for the instruction memory is going to be the output of some kind of a register that is driven by this clock. What this means that the I address will change shortly after the clock and will be fed into the instruction array. And what we would like is that the instruction will obviously be some kind of an output that is de derived from the instruction address, the I address and the content of the memory array but for now we will assume that we are doing something called an asynchronous read that is to say the instruction comes out in the same clock cycle as we will see later there are blocks of memory or certain kinds of implementations of memory that do not do this even if you give the instruction address they will wait until the next clock edge before the data actually comes out there is of course a reason for this it allows you to go for higher performance higher capacities but at the same time higher clock speeds we will look at the trade-offs later, but for the time being, we'll assume that it is possible to do asynchronous reads. That in turn actually leads us to the next topic, which is how do we implement this in hardware? FPGAs, after all our target over here is to use an FPGA. FPGAs have large blocks of memory, appropriately enough called BRAMs, block memories. These blo block RAMs come in multiples of 18 kilobits. Now this is not very large from the point of view of the memory that a modern computer has, but inside an FPGA, it is a serious chunk of storage because 18 kilobits essentially corresponds to the equivalent of storage of 18,000 registers or 18,000 flip-flops. And typically a single FPGA could have potentially even hundreds of such block RAMs, which means that Clearly, the number of bits that can be stored in block RAMs is far higher than what can be stored in individual registers. For our purposes, block RAMs pose a bit of a problem. In particular, they can only do synchronous reads. That is to say, if you give a, an address, if this is the clock, and we give an address shortly after the clock, and change it every time shortly after the clock, what we will find is that the I data that is read out will actually appear only at the next clock edge, shortly after the next clock edge to be precise. So the I address comes shortly after the clock edge, but the data comes at the next clock edge. And as you can see, this data which is happening at the second clock edge corresponds to the address that was given to it in the previous clock edge. What this means is that every time I give it an instruction address, the corresponding instruction will emerge only one clock cycle later. Now, this would be fine if all I was doing was continuous sequence of instructions in consecutive memory locations. 
But one of the purposes that we would like to use the instruction memory for is also to do branching. And when we get to the topic of branching, we'll find that having such synchronous reads enforced on us can actually be a bit problematic in terms of how we implement the hardware. For the time being, we will use another kind of memory for implementing the hardware of the memory storage, which is something called distributed memory and is once again available inside the FPGA. This distributed memory uses the lookup tables. If you think about it, lookup tables themselves are a form of memory. They can essentially, a four input lookup table, for example, can store up to 16 different values. That is for each of the combinations of the four different inputs, it will store a single bit. Therefore, it makes sense that we should be able to use these lookup tables in some way to store larger amounts of data. And it turns out that FPGAs do have some clever muxing logic that is built into them that allows you to group such lookup tables together and construct some amount of distributed memory. The nice thing about this distributed memory is that it allows asynchronous reads, which is what we need for our instruction memory. But on the other hand, it is much more limited. The number of bits of distributed memory that you can have in a typical FPGA is far smaller than the amount of block RAM. It is still considerably better than using the registers directly in the FPGA, but it essentially gives you some kind of a trade-off somewhere between the number of registers and the use of block RAM directly. So the question then becomes, how do we do all this? Do you actually need to go in and create primitives in the Xilinx Vivado software to create these memory blocks? In general, that is not required. The Xilinx Vivado compiler, in fact, is fairly good at recognizing memory blocks, provided that you write the code in a suitable manner. In fact, the simplest thing that can be done is to just declare an array of registers and this will automatically be inferred as some kind of a memory block. Even nicer is the fact that FPGAs allow initialization of memory blocks. And in fact, this is one place where the initial block in Verilog actually turns out to be synthesizable. You can use the initial block and in fact the read mem from a file command in order to actually read data from a file and this data will then be used to populate the memory at the time that the FPGA actually gets programmed. This is very powerful. It essentially allows us to do a very simple initialization of memory blocks, which can be used in order to set up the initial program that needs to run on the processor. Now, the array of course takes care of the storage itself and the initial takes care of the initial value loading, but we most likely want to change the values present in the memory and of course to read the data out. Now, in the case of instruction memory, we may not be very concerned about writing, but in general, what we need to keep in mind is that we typically use synchronous writes always for memory. That is, we always have an always at passage clock. Then we check if the write enable signal is activated, the mem of address the memory array can directly be updated with some value. Remember the typical directives regarding using non-blocking assignments and so on for passage of clock apply over here as well. You can just think of this in fact as a register that needs to get updated. The good thing is the compiler knows that it needs to infer a memory in this case. Now, one question that you might ask is, why do we bring the clock into the picture? Isn't it possible to do an asynchronous write? And the answer is, yes, it is possible. In general, what we'll be using is some kind of a latch kind of behavior or another way to think of it might in fact be to say that we will take the write enable signal and treat that itself as the clock that triggers the change in the content of the memory. In general, however, this is not an advisable way of implementing the logic. It's always preferable to have an explicit clock so that we do not have to worry about the relative timing differences between the write enable signal and other registers that are present in the system. Having everything working and working at the same clock allows us to do more accurate timing analysis and in general, better optimization of the design. 
and finally coming to the topic of reading for the instruction memory at least this is the most important part and as mentioned earlier there are two ways by which you can implement reading the first example given above says just use a continuous assignment statement this is enough to actually get inferred as an asynchronous read and if you use this and write a very log code corresponding to this and synthesize it you should find that it gets implemented directly as distributed ram on the other hand if you are able to accept the one cycle latency which is enforced by having a block ram or by having a passage clock for reading data it turns out that you can just make a very minor modification to the code written in the previous case and just bring in the always set passage clock and that's enough to make it a synchronous read which will get inferred and implemented as a bram the obvious advantage of using brams is capacity you have far more number of bits that can be stored and especially for data memory it probably makes more sense to try and implement it as bram even if there is an additional cycle latency for the instruction memory at least for the present scenario we will go ahead with the asynchronous read because it means that we do not have to worry about the problem with branching 